So leaves then in the plant tissue um, can regulate gas exchange, right? You need to have this dynamic system going on all the time, especially when you have light present and the light reactions because you're generating energy at that time and you want the Calvin cycle to be active so that you can be producing sugar molecules. So you have to have gas exchange. You have to have carbon dioxide coming into the leaf tissue and you have to be releasing that oxygen that's being produced in the light reactions. So plant leaves do this through special openings in the leaves called the stoma or the stomata. And this process is actually going to also regulate uh, transpiration. And uh, this includes gas exchange and also water exchange within the plant and the environment, right? So this is an opening to the environment. This would be the air around the leaf tissue, right? So uh, oftentimes, uh, plants will try to guard against having too much transpiration or water loss by having the stoma or the stomata on the underside of the leaves. So this would be uh, the top side uh, that's being exposed to the sun. So they face their leaves up towards the sun. The stoma are on the underside with the gas exchange. And this is to help avoid too much water loss with the hot sun beating down on them. You can see that leaf tissue is also lined by an epidermis uh, coming into it. And then there is a, a system of spongy mesophyll and then the palisade mesophyll. And you can see that these guys are all chock full of chloroplasts. Uh, these little orange things in here represent the mitochondria. So plant tissue has both chloroplasts and mitochondria. So you still have energy generation for cellular processes that are going on in there. And then the plant is also making its own food using the chloroplast system. You can also see here that you get a movement of fluids throughout the plant through both the xylem and the phloem. So this is a lot like our circulatory system. It's called a vascular bundle and transporting water and nutrients through that system. So if you have very high transpiration going on and there, it's a very hot day, the plant will uh, close the stoma or the stomata and this will inhibit gas exchange. And if you can't have this gas exchange, you're going to have a buildup of oxygen inside the tissue because the light's coming in and you're doing the light reactions and you're getting that byproduct. You're also going to have a reduction of carbon dioxide, right? Because you're gonna be using it up in the Calvin cycle to make the sugar molecules. So if you close this off and you can't have the incoming CO2 and the outgoing oxygen, you're going to cause the Rubisco enzyme to have that uh, higher levels of the oxygenase activity because there just won't be enough CO2 around and that ratio between those two gets off. So we'll come back and we'll talk more about how plants try to avoid the oxygenase reaction when they have to close their stomata to, to preserve water. Okay, so phase two of the Calvin cycle is the production of glucose. And this looks a lot like gluconeogenesis inside mammals. Right, so the same types of enzymes are gonna be involved in this process. So first we have to end up producing glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, but hopefully this looks familiar now than from uh, the glycolysis pathway. Um, and you do that through a phosphoglycerate kinase so that you make a bisphosphoglycerate. This is where the ATP is being utilized um, as the phosphate donor. And then there's a glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. So this is the reduction step that's then reducing the 1,3-bis-phosphoglycerate to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, right? And so that's also a product of the light reaction. And it takes 12 of these guys and 12 of these guys uh, to make one glucose molecule. So two of these three carbon units then are gonna go through these enzymatic steps to make one hexose or one molecule of glucose. The other 10 that get produced are gonna go into phase three and produce six molecules of ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate 
and recover the Calvin cycle. Okay, so once we make the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, we're going to use the aldolase. Um, we convert, there's also that isomerase that we have in the glycolytic pathway uh, that makes the DHAP. And then you can, so you convert one of these molecules to DHAP. Then you combine them both together and you make fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So you get one molecule of that. You're going to dephosphorylate it. You've got your fructose 1,6-bisphosphate phosphatase, similar to our gluconeogenic pathway. We make one molecule of our fructose 6-phosphate, the phosphoglucose isomerase, converts that to glucose 6-phosphate. Then you've got another isomerase that's going to shift the position of the phosphate from the 6 position to the 1 position. And then this one can uh, be dephosphorylated to produce a one molecule of glucose. This can then go off and uh, be moved around the plant um, down to the roots usually where it's stored as starch. So the Calvin cycle must make six turns to complete one molecule of glucose. Phase three is the recovery phase of our six molecules of ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. And so we use two molecules of our glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to make one glucose. We have 10 left to make our six ribulose 5-phosphates. And we'll just take a brief look at how this happens. You don't need to memorize this pathway. It's pretty crazy and convoluted. Um, so this is phase three now. So we're going to take four molecules of our glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. We're going to convert two of those guys into DHAP and then combine those two together or those four together. And then we'll make two molecules of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. These get converted to fructose 6-phosphate, right? So we get our two molecules of fructose 6-phosphate. This used two of our DHAP. Well, this used four of our, of our GAPs. Two were converted first to the DHAP. And then these were both combined together to make our two fructose 6-phosphate. We need two more of these guys to make DHAP and then four more GAPs, right? So if we're looking at this process here, we've got our ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, right? We're coming down here. We make our glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates. We use Two of these guys to make our fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. This gets dephosphorylated, and we get fructose 6-phosphate. So we're going to use a molecule of the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate um, to react with our fructose 6-phosphate. Right, So this is a 6-carbon molecule. This is a 3-carbon molecule. Um, we're going to transfer two of the carbons onto this. We're going to make one five carbon molecule and we're going to have a four carbon molecule left. So nine carbons, divide that differently than three and six. You can divide it into five and four. So how does that happen? Okay, so this is just a review of the sugar structures that are in this pathway, our glyceraldehyde. Um, it would be the three phosphate version. Um, the phosphate would be added at this position here, right? You've got ribose, our five carbon sugar here. Ribulose is the ketose version of ribose. So here is ribulose. Um, dihydroxyacetone is the ketone version of glyceraldehyde. And then we've got fructose, which is a ketone version of glucose. And then galactose is another six carbon sugar that is an isomer of glucose, an epimer, in fact. Okay, so there's two major types of enzymes that are used in the pentose phosphate pathway. The first one are transketolases. These ones transfer ketone groups from one ketose to an aldose sugar to make a new ketose. So you should remember what transketolases do. You don't have to remember every step in the um, Calvin cycle. 
But so what you have here is you have a, a ketos and an altos, and you're going to make a new ketos and a new aldose from these products. You're going to essentially transfer this portion of this molecule onto this one, right? And you're going to make an alcohol position here where you used to have the aldehyde, right? In that process, you're going to also uh, make this a carbonyl carbon and it gets converted then into an aldehyde. So you've got your initial ketose is going to become the aldose that's two carbon shorter, right? So um, if we start with a six carbon molecule like fructose and we use it to transfer the ketone functional group from it to an aldose, the glyceraldehyde three phosphate, we're going to shorten fructose by two carbons. So it's going to go from six carbons to four carbons. Our glyceraldehyde three phosphate is three carbons. If we add two more to it, we will have a five carbon unit. So that's how we get five and four um, in our production in the uh, pentose phosphate pathway or the Calvin cycle. Okay, the other enzyme type that is really active in the Calvin cycle are called the aldolases. You've already seen these types of reactions. Um, we see them going backwards in the glycolytic pathway. The aldolase is going to take the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, break it in half into the aldose, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and dihydroxyacetone phosphate, or DHAP. Right, so we're already familiar with this reaction from the glycolytic pathway. It's going in the reverse direction in the Calvin cycle, right? You're going to take this molecule and this molecule, put them back together and make fructose. Okay, so this one is adding a ketose and an aldose to make a new ketose, right? They're coming together to make one thing. All right, so let's go back and look at our diagram again. So we've got our fructose 6-phosphate uh, up here. We're going to add another molecule of the uh, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So the transketolase is, is acting here that's going to transfer the ketone from the fructose 6-phosphate to the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So this is three carbons plus two. That's going to make our five carbon xylulose 5-phosphate. This can just go through an isomerase reaction to make the ribulose 5-phosphate from this product here. Now we also um, are left, once we transfer two carbons from our six carbon fructose, we're going to have a four carbon sugar. This is called erythrose and it has a 4-phosphate on it. So we're going to take erythrose, we're going to convert um, one of our molecules of uh, GAP to DHAP, and we're going to combine it with that erythrose 4-phosphate. So this is 3 carbons plus 4 carbons. We're going to get a 7-carbon sugar out of this. This is called pseudoheptalose 1,7-bisphosphate. So this is taking our ketone and our aldehyde, right? The ketose, the aldose, and aldolase is the enzyme active here. It's going to combine those two guys together to make the pseudoheptalose 1,7-bisphosphate. So this one gets dephosphorylated into pseudoheptalose 7-phosphate, and then it's going to get um, reacted with another transketolase reaction so you again have seven carbon sugar and a three carbon sugar, right? This one is the ketose version. So a transketolase is going to transfer two carbons from our seven carbon. So seven minus two, we're going to get a five carbon sugar out there. And then our GAP is going to be three plus two carbons. That one actually makes the xylulose five phosphate, just like it did down here. The remaining 5-carbon sugar that comes from pseudoheptalose 7-phosphate is ribose 5-phosphate. So you get one new ketone, one new aldehyde or aldose. This one has a mutase enzyme that can convert it from the aldehyde form to the ketone form. 
and so it converts it to the ribulose 5-phosphate. This one can then be phosphorylated again to ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, and this whole awful cycle can begin again. So you can see at the end of the day, right, we're going to take our two fructose 6-phosphates with two GAPs at this step. We're going to make two molecules of xylulose 5-phosphate. These get converted back to two molecules of the ribulose 5-phosphate. Remember, we need to make six total. We also get two molecules of this out. We're going to use two molecules of DHAP here, and we're going to make two molecules of pseudoheptalose 1,7-bisphosphate. Two molecules get dephosphorylated, and then our last two molecules of GAP are going to go um, into this process to make our one step more to make our ribose 5-phosphate. We'll have two of these and two more xylulose 5-phosphate. Both of these, uh, two and two, plus the two we got from here, that makes six ribulose 5-phosphates. And we've recovered then the six molecules of ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate in part three. Okay, so this conversion of the xylulose 5-phosphate to ribulose 5-phosphate uses an epimerase, right? So these two guys are epimers, right? They only differ at this stereocenter position. So you need to use an epimerase to convert this to the ribulose 5-phosphate. Now it's in the right form for the Calvin cycle. Um, the phosphopento isomerase is going to be utilized to convert the aldose ketose pair and convert ribose 5-phosphate to ribulose 5-phosphate. So going from the aldose to the ketose. And then our kinase utilizing the ATP to phosphorylate this at the 1 position, giving 1,5-bisphosphate. So if we do a summary then of the light and the dark reactions, dark reactions over here listed just as light independent. They're not totally independent though. Um, we need light for this reaction, our inputs. We need ADP, we need NADP as the electron acceptor, and we need water as the electron donor. The outputs from the light reactions are the ATP, the reduced form of the NADP as NADPH, um, oxygen as a byproduct of the water molecule, and we get protons liberated here, right? So um, when you're pulling them off the water molecule, it's going to release the electrons, two electrons, one proton, and then plus the H+. Plus. Okay, so our light independent reactions for a single molecule of glucose, we're going to need 18 ATP, 12 NADPH, and 6 carbon dioxides as our, our input. And then that makes one molecule of glucose, 18 ADPs, and 12 NADPs. So you can see the inputs for the light reactions are made in the Calvin cycle. And the inputs for the light independent reactions or the Calvin cycle are made in the light reactions. So these guys are coupled together. So if you stop the light reactions, the Calvin cycle doesn't really work well because you're going to run out of NADPH and ATP pretty quickly. And so that will shut off as well. And then we also said that there's regulation based on the um, protons getting pumped into the thylakoid space and raising the pH of the stroma causes the release of magnesium back into the stroma where the Calvin cycle is happening and the Rubisco enzyme is being activated.